we'll see when I get around to it because we have two kids now. And yeah, you heard that. Evan we'll, has two kids in the house. Two kids, um, seven and eight years old. And so who knows what's going to happen from here, folks. <laughs> this could be the end. This could be <laughs> the final episode. It will not be the final episode, <laughs> but I cannot guarantee the um, the thoroughness of research for the next couple of weeks until I learn to adjust to two children constantly peeking their heads in and being like, can I get this? Can I do that? What are you doing? What are these microphones are? Can we sing? Um, they want to sing? <laughs> they want to sing. Oh my God. You can start a, the <laughs> next the next Jackson 5, but it could be the Jackson 2. <laughs> <laughs> there you go so yeah but yeah that's so that's that's my life what's your life like right now um my life i'm coming down from a little a little manic episode i was in um so you might hear my voice dragging a little bit this week i definitely woke up <laughs> today and i was like ah Back to normal. Is it nice to feel that, like, is it, do you feel like a break and relief, or do you feel, like, frustrated because you're, like... So here's, so, um, my therapist, uh, recently, I don't know if she can technically diagnose, I don't know if mm-hmm. therapists are allowed to do that, or if it has to be a psychiatrist, but she basically said, like, psych- uh, cyclomanic, I think is what it's called, and it's, um... Cyclomanic? Lo- yeah, mm-hmm. that's probably, you know, it's something like that, cyclo <laughs> something. She kept saying it, and I still don't remember what it's called, um, but basically it's a very, it's like a baby form of bipolar, mm-hmm. so where I don't have hallucinations or anything like that, but my moods do swing from very highs to very lows, and when I'm in the highest state, I can wake up at 4 a.m. with full energy and go, mm-hmm. I, like, I can literally run... On three hours of sleep a night. No problem. I have more energy than your average person, like, fully energized and ready to go. And during that time, it's really stressful because there's also, like, 800 thoughts going through my head. Yeah. And I'm thinking all of these thoughts at the same time. So it's not like I'm thinking a thought and then I'm like, okay, on to the next thought. They're all spinning at the same time. And there's also music playing in my head (laughs) of whichever song is stuck in my head at the time. But it allows me to be very creative and... um. That's usually when I make a biggest push on the website. So I'll make, I'll mm-hmm. design new merch or I'll, that's how I uh, did Queer Digest and mm-hmm. I started researching other things and I bought a few books. So it allows me to be really creative and I really like it. Like mm-hmm. my therapist was like, maybe you should talk to somebody, get out some medicine and like that'll level you out. But I don't want to lose that mm-hmm. because that's, I don't know, it's part of me, I guess. And it's, I want to yeah. harness it and work on it rather than eliminating it. Yeah. So I do like it. It is stressful. Probably annoys the fuck out of David because he <laughs> just wants to relax, and and I'm just like running everywhere, full energy, waking up, getting out of the bed. Yeah. Um, but then when I come down, the first few days are kind of like a hangover because mm-hmm. my body's like, "You've slept like ten hours in the last three weeks," so it's <laughs> it, I don't know. It's like a very hard drag. But then when I'm I'm normal, it's fine. Yeah, it just is like an adjustment period. Yeah. So that's that. <laughs> that's that. That's Paul's, Paul's mind. Well, I mean, I don't. I don't want to say I'm. I'm happy because I don't know. What it's like to have to kind of be in those swings, but you do great work. Oh, I do do. That's why I'm like. Swings, I'm like amazing work. I'm like I can't lose that. That's yeah. like. Yeah. Well, I think, but there's a lot of artists that are like that, mm-hmm. and they they you know there's not like this constant. Um, production of art it usually comes in these moments and we we put it as like you know they're inspired or they have a muse but often it's because they're in a manic swing and they're producing incredible art i can think things that i never would have conceptualized yeah because the rate that my mind processes information and comes up with new ideas is so accelerated i just i I don't really know how to explain it i can literally come up with a million different ideas and be like all of these could be successful and then i'll try to do some of them and i'm like okay you have 30 projects going paul you have to focus on one yeah well that's i think that's the thing is like focusing on it which i i also struggle on focusing on things too of like you have great ideas but then you don't follow through with the great Mm -hmm. ideas because you know, as things wear off, you don't have the energy that you have. And I need more time in a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So I think, but there's also like, there is a stigma to mania. Of, like it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's like you said, it's learning to harness it mm-hmm. and it's learning to be aware of what you're doing. And then like, oh, and I'm, I'm talking like, I, I know it's more than just be aware of yourself. I'm not trying to act, come off as like a dick. I just mean that like, 
I think that there's like you can find ways to be really productive and if you don't follow through on every project that you put in place okay so right. what <laughs> you know yeah the the worst thing is okay I don't want to say the worst thing but for me I love learning new things so mm-hmm. when I'm in my manic thing I'm like okay I should get a violin and learn how to play the violin I should get a guitar and learn how to play the guitar I should get like I just all yeah. of these things that I want to learn how to do before I die I'm like yeah. oh my god do yeah. it all now that's literally what I was telling Samantha the other day. I was like, I was like, what if I die and I've never done this, this, and this? I was like, I can't die and have never like made a mark on the world. And she's like, Evan, you've done a lot of things. You're good. I'm like, I have done nothing. That's how I feel. I just <laughs> like, I literally, during one of my manic episodes, I learned how to make soap because I was like, I just want to learn how to make soap. And that's the most random hobby. That's true. And he had for a soap business I had business a whole business and I was making some while. money and I followed through with it. But then I was you like, did. this is not, this is not, um, it's doesn't like make it. enough money for the effort I have to put in. Also not you really, your passion in life. It no, was but like, it was it's fun. Not, it was it. fun. Yeah. But like for a little while, it looked like you were going to like be the next soap maker, like the next um, dial industry. <laughs> and then, and he was constantly coming over and bringing me bars of soap. Because I was making so much. Good <laughs> 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 stuff. Mm, mania. It's fun. Just try it sometime. <laughs> okay, I thought about the the only way I can explain it is imagine if your constant state was over caffeinated. Like you drank two cups of coffee too much. Yeah. Like that's just how you wake up and you go. Like that's just the default. And then yeah. your mind is just always going. Mm. So that's been us 10 minutes talking about nothing. But yeah. welcome to your queer story. Welcome. <laughs> we really should get to our episode today because it's a longer script, you know, than what we normally do for like a, an, a, an hour mm-hmm. long episode. But it's not quite long enough for two episodes. So right in the middle there. Because... I don't know. I don't know why I wrote it so long. It's a good. There's well, a lot of information. It's, it is a lot, and it's a very interesting story, and uh, there's a lot of layers to it. But um, before we do that, I just want to encourage you to, um, you know, like, subscribe, download, and review the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. And also, you can check out our Patreon at Your Queer Story. Patreon.com slash your, your queer story. story. Yep. And um, for as low as $3 a month, you can get um, access to exclusive content, which usually is some behind the Queens episodes, which drops when we release it. Um, and then other content that we just drop periodically. But mostly what your um, donations go to is to funding the other efforts that we do, such as the podcast, um, our peer mentorship program, and our uh, support group that is held virtually. And if you're interested in joining our support group, you just have to send us an email at yourqueerstory at gmail.com. Yep. And I just wanted to remind everybody that any money we make goes directly back into the podcast. Mm-hmm. Nothing goes into our pockets. Nope. Um, we have never made any money off of this podcast. We do it strictly for the community and to help people. We don't, yeah, we made no money. We don't buy things for ourselves like any like shirts and stuff we have is stuff that we got through like like making a partnership with the uh the company that we what is it t public yeah but through it's we got those we got shirts like through companies giving us samples not we didn't like buy our oh yeah, yeah yeah samples of the merchandise yeah also there was a there was a comment and we have been working on it but um there was you know somebody so we moved to a new platform because we want it more options and we want it cheaper options and they give a lot of great sales and it's the cheapest but best quality material that we have um the problem is they only put sizes in male and female and that's something that we're working on i've been getting i've got some suggestions from a friend of other companies that do unisex sizes and so we're gonna uh trying to present it as other companies will give us unisex options so please can you give us unisex options Mm -hmm. so we're trying to do that um but we're not so we're not um ignoring our non-binary individuals it's just that um, it's very hard to find companies that will give you sizes in unisex and also give you good prices and also give you good quality so, and a variety of products at a variety of prices and are ethically sound exactly. so trying to bring together a group of things so this company is is ethically sound good quality good prices and we're trying to work on making sure that they're more um queer inclusive mm-hmm Today, we are covering one of the most heartbreaking and bizarre cases in modern modern medical history. The story of David Reimer has been used as both a platform for reform around acceptance of intersex identities and as a weapon against transgender children transitioning at a young age. 
What is more interesting, though, is that David Reimer was neither intersex nor transgender, yet his body and his legacy have been used as an exhibition for the rest of the world. Nothing better encapsulates the toxicity of social standards around masculinity and, femini and femininity than this story. And while Reimer was, part of, was not part of the LGBTQ community, his case and his abuse shed light on the many harms done against queer individuals. So, let us start at the beginning of what would become known as the John Joan case. On August 22nd, 1965, Ron and Janet Reimer welcomed two twin boys named Bruce and Brian into the world. I added that part. I added my own script. <laughs> For the most part, the twins were healthy, yet around six months, it became evident that they were both suffering from a condition known as phimosis, which is when the foreskin on the penis stretches over the glands and cannot be pulled back, and that can cause some pain during sex or urination. A local doctor arranged to perform a circumcision on the twins and began with Bruce. However, rather than using the standard tool of a scalpel, the doctor used the unconventional method of cauterization, which is a process of burning off the unnecessary tissue that resulted in Bruce's circumcision being botched and the extreme damage being done to the penis. There's no record of how bad the damage truly was. The writers have insisted it was, de it was destroyed beyond repair. Reimer's biographer, John Calab Calapinto, Calapinto has implied the penis was neither severed or burned beyond function. The author wrote that one psychiatrist summar summarized the extent of the injury this way. He will be unable to cons consummate marriage or have normal heterosexual relations. He will have to recognize that he is incomplete, physically defective, and that he must live apart. There has been some challenge to the authenticity of this previous statement as it was retold by Reimer's parents more than 30 years later. And I just want to pause and say, so John Calapino is the main contributor to this um, uh, episode um, because he is the one who wrote the um, article years later that broke the story on this. And he also wrote the book about this, which then inspired the documentary. So I'd say like the majority of your information that you hear about the uh, the Reimer case or the John Joan case Reimer. is Reimer case. God, the Reimer case or the John Joan case is um, from John Calapino. Um, so just giving him credit up front because uh, most uh, most of the quotes in here are, are from him in like some story or some or book that he wrote. Um, also, he, again, this was reported on decades later. So as much you're not as you're going to have all the accuracies. Yeah, you're requoting the people, but the basic, the, you know, mm -hmm. the sentiment. So, like as I wrote, the sentiment in this psychiatrist's observation towards those considered defective still lingers. The Bruce certainly would not have an easy road ahead to imply that he would be incomplete and live apart. Showed the bias against intersex and trans individuals, while the stressor on his inability to have quote unquote normal heterosexual relations categorize non-heteronormative relationships as inferior so here i mean when the psychiatrist says that first of all he's just like he's basically telling him you're going to be broken there's something wrong with you nobody's going to want to be around you right. or not telling bruce but telling bruce's parents and then also the um idea of like it's so important to have normal heterosexual relations what's he going to do in life without a penis the penis is everything exactly how and just is he going to live <laughs> Back to these very binary approaches to sex and how we have sex and how important sex and penises are. Because I really do wonder if the, if Bruce had, had been born a, a girl and with a vagina, a person with a vagina, um, I wonder how much um, stress there would have been around it. The fact that he was assigned a boy and he had a penis – there was very much the factor of like this is such an, a vital piece to your identity. Right. You have to have it. So, from this analysis, both the parents and the general practitioner agreed that they needed outside help. The frantic parents spent the next year and a half looking for a solution for their young child. Meanwhile, Bruce's brother, Brian, was not given a circumcision and his phimosis healed naturally, which is really sad because if you had just waited, like, probably another year, none of this would have happened. Stop circumcising your children unnecessarily. Right? That should be a choice for the child. Yeah, when it's they're older, if they're like, you know what, I don't like this, let me... Can Honestly, take care of this. This this the the Reimer story is a perfect example of why children deserve rights and to be heard. Because in every step, the Reimer boys had their rights completely stripped away. All in the idea of this is what's best for the child. I'm older, so I must know what's best for the child. You mm -hmm. do not know what is best for a person's identity or their body. They are, have autonomy over their body. Mm -hmm. Anyways. 
So, just as it seemed that they were running out of options, Ron and Janet saw a Canadian news segment that featured the renowned sexologist John Money. Money had spent the previous 15 years establishing his reputation as a psychologist and sexologist in the United States. Born in New Zealand, Money had graduated with a double master's from the Victoria University of Wellington. Shortly after his graduation, John took a po- position. <laughs> John took a pos- position on staff at the University of Otago. This was the first time he crossed a boundary as a professional, using his author- authority as a psychologist to justify overriding the rights of another individual. It is not clear if Money believed his position in education gave him the level of authority, or if he was simply driven by his own questions and understanding. Whatever the reason, when famed author Janet Frame studied under him in 1945, she submitted an essay that described thoughts of suicide. Money had Frame committed which resulted in eight years of confinement and a near lobotomy for the young writer. So Janet, This guy is just a, a maniac. Uh, not a maniac. I'm a maniac. This a, guy is just a lunatic. He's like, he's a narcissist. He's a control mm-hmm. freak. He's like, I'm right. Everybody just needs to listen to me. He wants the fame. Then He wants to be someone. Yeah. It's very, yeah, very much like whatever he thinks should be done is what should be done. And then he has the power He uh, more and through time, he gains more and more power where he makes things happen. So mm-hmm. Janet Frame, especially in Australia um, or New Zealand um, was very much um, a very uh, well-known writer and she became well-known in um, through her writing while she was institutionalized and she was first institutionalized by John money. Um, and like we said, like she's like days away from a lobotomy when her first writing really takes off and she becomes famous. And then now people are like, again, this talks about what you're talking about earlier, that whole thing of like, people are like, you're manic, you're crazy, or even you're depressed. So you're no good to society. We'll get rid of you. I, we are evolving past that, but especially in the 1960s or this was like 1950s, um, very much that stigma around it. And so, you know, she's a famous writer and that's, that mania is giving her this creativity, but they also want to take that mania away from her. Right. And John Money thinks that he has authority to just be like, well, you talked about suicide. Clearly you must be instant. You must have to be institutionalized. The hardships of Janet Frame cannot be fully attributed to John Money. However, he did play a pivotal role in her life, and two decades later, he would play a much more life-altering role in another young person's life. After immigrating to the United States in 1947, John earned his Ph.D. at Harvard and took a job at John Hopkins University, where he would work for the next 56 years. It is clear that Money's greatest and only real passion in life was his career and studies. He was married briefly during the 1950s, but the union fell apart. That could have been a result of John's view on sex and his own bisexuality, which he treated in an almost clinical manner, or the divorce could have simply been due to his sole devotion to his research. Throughout the 50s, John Money began to write in-depth about gender and sex and the differences between the two. Our understanding of gender identity today, Jenner. Our understanding of gender identity today stems from Money's research. He became fascinated, especially with transgender and intersex people, who he believed proved that gender was a construct. His focus in the 1950s was mostly on intersex folks, and through that work, he coined the term and definition of the phrase gender role. Whereas society saw gender strictly through the lens of masculine and feminine to be assigned based on an individual's genitals, Money broadened the idea of gender to encompass a person's full identity. Throughout the 50s, John Money began to write in-depth about gender and sex and the differences between the two. Our understanding of gender identity today stems from Money's research. He became fascinated, especially with transgender and intersex people, who he believed proved that gender was a construct. His focus in the 1950s was mostly on intersex folks, and through that work, he coined the term and definition of the phrase gender role. Whereas society saw gender strictly through the lens of masculine and feminine to be assigned based on an individual's genitals, Money broadened the idea of gender to encompass a person's full identity. This removed the idea that genitals were the sole basis for gender identity and expression. It was a revolutionary development for the trans and intersex community. So there's two things with money here because, like, you know, we hear that still a lot today. Like, gender is a construct. And we say that on this podcast, but we're referring to mostly gender roles. Mm-hmm. Like, this idea that you have to fit a certain role and you have to fit in a certain binary gender. With John Money, he's developing this idea of, like, your genitals don't have to determine your gender, which is fine. Great. That's what allowed a lot of transgender people to be able to, and even non-binary folks and even intersex folks, obviously, um, mostly intersex folks, to be able to to identify 
But what Money believed, though, was that in when in saying that gender was a construct, he also believed that everything that we learned about gender or our our gender identity was through um through nurture. So how we identified in the world, he did not believe that a person was born with an innate sense of their gender identity. And because of that, he believed that any person could be conditioned to be any gender that they they any gender they wanted. And I think he kind of really really mixed up intersex people and transgender people because transgender people are often assigned a sex that does not fit their gender identity and they fight against that. Whereas intersex people are born with often, at least at this time with genitalia that um, is assigns them a gender and then they're just get, and they're just forced to conform. Mm -hmm. So what John Money was doing was he was forcing gender, he was forcing intersex people to conform to a gender identity that he assigned to them. And then he would condition them to embrace that gender identity. So that was kind of it. Like he believed that you, there was no born with anything. There was not a nature versus nurture. It was all nurture. And that plays a heavy part into the Reimer story. Reimer. Reimer. I'm literally going to say Reimer a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Reimer, Reimer, Reimer. By 1965, Money had established himself as an expert on gender, and John Hopkins awarded him the funds for the John Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic. Money and his colleague Claude Midgen performed their first sex reassignment affirmation surgery the following year. Note, the correct terminology for trans surgeries is sex-affirming surgery. However, in the case of John Money, reassignment is a better description. For several decades, many of his surgeries were reassignment surgeries and not affirming ones as several of the patients operated on never had any say in their surgeries or their assigned identities. But it was his research at the John Hopkins Gender Identity Clinic that landed Dr. Money a spot on the Canadian television news program This Hour Has Seven Days. Sounds like my mania. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. That's going to be your blog title. Mm-hmm. In February of 1967, the parents of Bruce and Brian Reimer saw the sexologist on television. Janet later recalled, he was saying that it could be that babies were born neutral and you can change their gender. Something told me that I should get in touch with this Dr. Money. There seems little doubt that Money was thrilled at the case that had been that had fallen in his lap. The idea that intersex children should be assigned a gender at birth had been a part of history forever. Most parents made their best guess and raised the intersex baby by the social norms of whatever gender they had chosen. But here, money saw an opportunity to tr- but here, money saw an opportunity to truly test his theories about gender. Bruce Reimer would be forced to live the rest of his life, or at least the first half of his life, without a penis. There were no penile construction surgeries that could be performed on an infant, and the surgical process for adults was still in its early stages. Imagine if they had just waited and he could have, you know, 20 years. Yeah. All the advancements that it would have made. Yep. At best, Bruce could hope for surgery in his 20s, (laughs) (laughs) and in his lifetime, he would never have a full function. Yet, rather than embracing the ambiguous genitalia, ambiguous means unclear and is often used to describe atypical genitals and gonads, Money proposed a different solution. He convinced the parents to raise their mutilated son as a girl. The doctor mistakenly did not realize that the social constructs of gender expression were not the same as the personal concept of gender identity. Money believed that the Rhymers simply raised, that if the Rhymers simply raised Bruce as a girl, he, Bruce, would adapt to the role placed upon him. This seems to contradict Money's own work as he operated on transgender individuals. If a person could learn to conform to a role placed upon them, then why did transgender people exist? It seems that John was mostly tempted by the prospects of the study. The fact that Bruce's penis had been destroyed was only one motivating factor in Money's experiments. There was also the tantalizing point that Bruce was a twin. Over the previous 20 years, details about the the Nazi experiments in the death camps had slowly started to filter back to the United States. Dr. Joseph Mengele... Mengele. Dr. Joseph Mengele had experimented on 732 sets of twins during World War II and over 3,000 children in total. Mengele was possibly the cruelest of all of Hitler's henchmen and by far one of the most hunted Nazis when the war ended. His hellish experiments on children were the stuff of nightmares, and the doctor was especially partial to twins since their identical, since their identical makeup made them great test subjects. One twin would be used as a... Con- one twin would be used as a control subject and untouched, while the other was subjected to torturous experiments. 
When the twin being experimented on died, the controlled twin was also killed and both children were dissected and further examined. Mangala was especially cruel to twins that were of Romani descent, a mix of Indonesian and Aryan ethnicity. Uh, Romani are also often called travelers or a slur that we will not use. We made mm-hmm. a mistake once before in trying to identify. Um, so, uh, and I only put this in about M- Mangala because while people have been using twins for a long time, the thing about Mangala, and there has been a thousand like journal pieces and books written on this, the thing is that the Nazis' experiments advanced medicine. Mm-hmm. But there's always this thing of is it ethical to use that their work because of how unethical the studies were. And what Mangala da- did was he really put like while people had been using twins, he really showed how beneficial twins could be in experiments because – Again, you have a control subject. That's what's ideal. Like if you're experimenting on anything else, you want a control that is stable and has, you know, and that remains stable. And then you want. And um, is exactly the same. Exactly the the same. And then you have the other one that you can experiment on. So you can see what the differences are and what the different reactions are. And so it was Mangala that really made this more prominent. And it's interesting to me because by the 1960s, the horrors of what really happened were really coming out and people were starting to find out more and still i i I don't know i'm not i'm not comparing um money to joseph mangala i would never do that i just think it's interesting that with everything going on i i think that that there was something about that that attributed Mm -hmm. to that he was probably like well Let's see. Well, again, it's just, even if it's just the basic fact of, of using the twin and the excitement of being able to use a twin to get mm-hmm. more information. By the 1960s, stories and firsthand accounts of Mengele's atrocities were told as Nazi hunters scoured the globe in search of the escaped doctor. They never found it, by the way. Oh, shit. Yeah. While his methods were certainly not condoned, the practice of experimenting on twins had always been a favorite tactic in the medical field, and John Money now had a seemingly perfect opportunity land in his lap. He could prove his theories on gender through Bruce and Brian Reimer. In order to further his efforts, he convinced the Reimers to grant approval for an orchiectomy, which is the removal of the testes, on the 22-month-old Bruce. They also agreed to hormonal treatments, gender therapy, and the construction of a vulva. To complete the transition, the parents changed Bruce's name to Brenda. For the next 12 years, Dr. Money tracked the case he called John Joan, gaining widespread attention and acclaim. He claimed his studies and so-called transition of patient Joan were a success even long after he stopped seeing the Reimer children. In some ways, it was because of the John Joan case that many sexologists and endocrinologists developed better treatments and care for intersex and transgender children. But the fundamental concept of gender identity was still being developed, and the experiment of Bruce and Brian Reimer caused immense psychological harm, a fact that would be used as a weapon against the queer community by others who also did not understand gender identity. Yeah, so, and I didn't put a lot in there, but you have like a lot of far right groups that'll say, like, the, what happened to David, because he later changed his name to David. David Reimer is proof of what happens when you experiment on young children. And it's true, you experiment on a child that doesn't want this, that is abuse. This right. is, and that's again conflating this idea of um, conflating this idea that you could that a that David Reimer who had no idea that what that he had been born with a penis and had no idea of his sex his first sex assigned at birth and then forcing him into this role like that is abuse that's abuse it's just as abusive as taking a transgender child who's assigned female at birth and forcing that child to live as a female when they tell you that they're a boy right. both of those things are abuse and i know what point i was trying to make with mangala is that both of these twin studies were unethical that's what that was my there connection i'm not just randomly going off on things <laughs> um so the word intersex is defined by the Interact Advocates for Intersex Youth as an umbrella term that covers a variety of unique variations in reproductive or sex anatomy. Variations may appear in a person's chromosomes, genitals, or internal organs like testes or ovaries. Some intersex traits are identified at birth, while others may not be discovered until puberty or later in life. Statistics show that 1.7% of the population is intersex, meaning well over 5 million Americans are intersex and nearly 120 million people worldwide have some type of intersex variation. That's just about the same percentage of redheads and twins, by the way. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, how many redheads do you know? Mm -hmm. Probably how many intersex people you know. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's a really good point. You probably you it's almost certain that you know right. of a intersex person, whether it's a close friend or it's like a somebody's cousin, something mm-hmm. like that. Somebody you met, you know. Yeah, someone at work. It is important to note that an intersex person is born with these traits and they are not a result of outside circumstances, unlike the case of Bruce Reimer, where his gender was altered and controlled by doctors. Similarly, the National Center for Transgender Equality defines the umbrella term of transgender as such. When we're born, a doctor usually says that we're male or female based on what our bodies look like. Most people who were labeled male at birth turn out to actually identify as men, and most people who were labeled female at birth grow up to be women. But some people's gender identity, their innate knowledge of who they are, is different from what was initially expected when they were born. Most of these people describe themselves as transgender. Trans is often used as a shorthand for transgender. So again, we see that this term did not apply to Bruce Reimer, who had no say in his gender identity. In fact, Reimer's gender identity was actually assigned to him twice as an infant, once when he was assigned male at birth, and 22 months later when he was assigned female by Dr. Money. And for the first 13 years of Bruce's life, he had no idea of his first gender assignment. Yet he never felt right in the gender that was thrust upon him. In this way, Bruce Reimer's frustration mirrored those of intersex and transgender people. Though through an unethical and abusive method, Money had managed to prove his point about gender, only not in the way he thought he was proving his point, and certainly not in the accurate reporting of his studies. So the thing is, and this is why trans activists and intersex activists do use the story of Bruce Reimer, or because David Reimer, because it showed that you can't force a person into a gender identity through any kind of conditioning. So even though he was not trans and he was not intersex, he proved the point. Right. Of, of an, yeah. Completely proved of it. a cisgender person, he proved the point that you can't force someone into a gender identity. Mm-hmm. At age 13, Bruce Reimer was finally told the truth about the experiment he had been in for the majority of his life. The young man felt disgusted and out of touch with his body. He struggled with what is known as dysphoria, in which an individual feels their gender does not align with the gender they were assigned. But most disturbingly, Bruce was suicidal over his appointments with Dr. Money. He told his parents that if they made him see the doctor again, he would take his own life. Finally, Janet and Ron relented and ended Bruce and Brian's therapy with Dr. Money. Within a few months, Bruce Bruce reclaimed his male identity and had his name legally changed from Brenda to David. He began testosterone treatments and underwent several sex affirmation surgeries. Had he just been left alone... Right. It never... It was just... Yeah. It was was an awful thing to do to anyone, especially a child. Um, From this next point on, I guess you a trigger warning because now we're going to kind of go backwards a little bit and talk more about the experiments. So if you don't want to hear about that, maybe wrap it up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. However, the full damage of money's so-called treatment would not be uncovered until 17 years later. During this time, the doctor continued to grow in popularity and prominence. David and Brian Reimer ended their sessions with money in 1980, but throughout the following two decades, the doctor continued to speak about the great successes of the John Joan case. He wrote several books that discussed the study, including one titled Man, Woman, Boy, Girl, and expanded his thoughts about gender, sex, and sexual orientation. It was Dr. John Money who coined the term sexual orientation, along with expanding and revolutionizing modern concepts of sexual identity. It was actually Money that really made it from, again, where people thought that uh, so it's just so backwards his thinking like people thought that you were conditioned to be um gay and money came along and said no you're born to be gay and then he turns around and he's like but you are conditioned to be man or woman and we can condition you such i don't know money what the fuck Mm -hmm. you're thinking Meanwhile, David and Bryant Reimer struggled with chronic depression and social adjustment. David married, and he and his wife adopted three children. Though he settled down and seemed to have a fairly average life, the secrets of the past destroyed any hope of peace. In March of 1997, psychiatrist Keith Sigbudson and biologist Milton Diamond released an article in the Archives of Adolescent and Pediatric Medicine that finally challenged John Money's infamous John Joan case. The medical world was rocked by the proposal that one of the most popular and revered studies of the modern era was actually a major failure. What's more, evidence seemed to suggest that Dr. Money either knew of this failure or deliberately never followed up with his subjects for fear of learning the truth. But shocking stories in the world of medicine rarely break through to mainstream media. 
That would change with the December 1997 issue of the Rolling Stone magazine when the article The True Story of John Joan was released by journalist John Calapino. Calapino. (laughs) I'm probably butchering his name, but that's how I've done it. Calapino. Um, It was quickly apparent that Calapino detested the mere name of John Money. This disdain may have been purely based in the journalist's discoveries during the story of David and Brian Reamer. There, yet Reimer. there, were, David and Brian Reimer. Yet there are also doses of homophobia and transphobia mixed in Calipino's attack on the doctor. And there is Money's own previous controversies that had drawn outrage over his defense and lenient stance on pedophilia. The doctor often tried to make distinctions in pedophilia, implying that some acts and attractions may be normal. He told the Journal of Pedophilia in 1991. If I were to see the case of a boy, age 10 or 11, who's intensely erotically attracted toward a man in his 20s or 30s, if the relation is totally mutual and the bonding is genuinely totally mutual, then I would not call that pathological in any way. A 10 or 11 year old being... Right? He's claiming that they... they erotically attracted. They're attracted and it's mutual, so it's okay. I'm When I was 10 or 11, I was like coloring and playing video games. I was not interested it's this entire thing in the in the pedo- world of pedophilia where they lie and tell us that children can be around like children do go through like they do have questions about that that is normal but if they they tell themselves this lie if this child can be attracted to me and can have autonomy over themselves and they are on the same level as me and we're both equal like i'm attracted to you you're attracted to me it's mutual it's okay but they don't factor in the fact that a child does not understand their attractions and that is the fundamental difference yep money stance on pedophiles certainly were heavily implied to connect the discoveries in the john joan case david and brian reimer recounted their story to calafino dr money had seen the twins roughly once every year between 1968 and 1980 By the time the twins were six years old, he began to have joint and one-on-one sessions with the two subjects. His questions from their earliest recollection were deeply personal and focused prominently on sex. Calipino stated that Money believed it was essential for children to understand the difference is between sex. In fact, Money himself stated this and presented his methods in the 1975 book, Sexual Signatures of Being a Man or a Woman, which he wrote in the middle of his case study of John Joan. The physician wrote, Explicit sexual pictures can and should be used as part of a child's sex education to reinforce his or her own gender identity and gender role. That's frightening. Yeah. So he's not like t- being like, oh, I'm trying to help, you know, teach kids about sex, which is still like he's like showing naked pictures to kids and being like, see, this is what needs to get you excited. He was obsessed with making sure that Bruce Reimer got excited about pictures of girls so that he could. Um, you know, embrace his body and then want to be attracted to girls because that was also part of it. It was important that Bruce be attracted to women, right? Because you Bruce need to be attracted Bruce oh, the, because the as friend. a girl, I don't, I don't want to use his name, but Brenda Joan be attracted to, um, or sorry, not women, uh, be attracted to men. Okay, that's yes. Right. I'm sorry. It was important that Joan be heterosexual. So Joan has to be attracted to men. So he's showing it, um, Joan pictures of naked men, and Joan has to be attract or has to love a woman's body because Joan needs to embrace their women's bot their female body. His practices, monies, were confirmed by David and Brian, who stated he would show us pictures of kids, boys and girls, with no clothes on. The twins stated and also recalled that Dr. Money also showed them pictures of adults engaged in sexual intercourse. This is as early as age six. He'd say to us, I want to show you pictures of things that mom and dads do. But the doctor went even further in his attempts to condition gender roles and identity into the minds of the young twins. He forced the children to strip naked, inspect each other's genitals, and and imitate sexual acts on one another. Sometimes Money would have as many as six colleagues in a session with him watching the children, and if they defied his orders to perform, he would become enraged and intimidated the siblings until they complied with his demands. This guy was just a child predator. It just was. Like, can you imagine? Like, they're six years old, or they're, you know, even as they get older, like, there's stories, and I didn't put them in here, of him telling the kids, you need to take your clothes off. There's six people standing around. And the kids are like, no, I don't want to do that. And he starts shouting at them, and he'd be like, now, take him off now. And he just demand them to do things like their dogs. And then they would have to sit there and people would like touch them. And, and then he'd force them, like I said, to like get on top of each other and make sexual acts. And, and it was just... I think his colleagues are just pet predators and they all wanted to... Fuck all his colleagues. This is 
corner. You also but... took pictures of the kids, which I didn't yeah, put in a, here. I'm... And then like, and then, you know, kept the pictures and, and you put that with the, the notes on pedophilia and it's just like, the dots are connected. They're there. I don't know, man. Like, he, you know, pff, he, j- he saw himself as a sexually liberated person, but really it seems like you're just a fucking creep. Right. And these poor children. These these are just the things that came to light. Who knows what he did right. to these children and, in the dark. And John Money was one of the most revered and respected sexologists in the world. And even to this day, there are still people like, well, he had his flaws, but you know, he did the best he can. Fuck that shit. No, do not tell me that. Uh, like he, So even when these doctors came out with him, they kind of thought their careers were over. When they wrote that article outing him, they were like, well, I mean, we're done, but we, we mm-hmm. got to do this. Early on, both David and Brian realized that David did not fit the female role assigned to him. There was nothing about David that wanted or felt like a woman, and Brian watched as his brother was constantly forced into a role he hated. Young David was bullied at school, rejected by his peers, and disdained by his teachers. Ironically, the very thing that doctors stated would happen to David if he did not take on the role of a girl was happening to him because because he was living in a role the world could see did not fit him. Right, like when they said, you know, you'll be... Uh, outcast from the world they're like if you don't become a girl right and then but the the world was just like this kid doesn't seem to fit in like they right. just didn't Something's get it. off they're not they could tell there was something very mm-hmm. much off despite the evidence money refused to acknowledge david's unhappiness and insisted that the discomfort came because david had not fully undergone vaginal construction surgery when david staunchly refused the surgery the doctor again became angry showing pictures of young naked girls and asking don't you want to be a normal girl but david did not want to be a quote-unquote normal girl or any kind of girl right so they had constructed a vulva but they had not there had not been like a um you couldn't didn't have the ability like as an infant to do a full vaginal construction and david talks about how he knew if I had that surgery, then there's no going back, mm-hmm. which isn't fully isn't true. But like that's how he felt. Like, well, I'm sure as a child, you're like, I'm already here. If yeah. I go any further, right? I'm that's it for me. I exactly. Can, the fear you don't you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And he so he's fighting back the way he can. Like this by not having the surgery, he can, um, you know, he can fight back against money and this role that's being placed on him. However, Money deliberately twisted the truth in his annual report of the John Joan case that year. In the 1975 update he published in Archives of Sexual Behavior, the doctor added this statement about David. No one outside the family knows that she was a born a boy, nor would they ever conjecture. Her behavior is so normally that of an active little girl and so clearly different by contrast from the boyish ways of her twin brother that it offers nothing to stimulate one's conjectures. This summary was printed when the twins were 10 years old and both were actively reporting David dif- David's difficulties adjusting to his assigned role, both socially and privately. So the twins are telling people he's not doing okay at school. School. And John and Money knows that David is pushing him back on the vaginal surgery, and he's still getting there. He's and like being everything's like, great. Don't it's worry great. about it. Couldn't go better. Couldn't, there's nothing wrong. She's growing up great. Yeah. You know, there's that's it's good. It's everything we could have ever imagined. Just keep keep paying me, keep sponsoring <laughs> me. Let me do more research. It's all good. Yeah, exactly. It is uncertain how long Doctor Money's abuse would have been allowed to continue if not for school intervention when David was eleven. Middle school brings out most of our fears and nerves, and for David Reimer, it further multiplied years of anxiety, stress, and social isolation. The teachers at the school notified the Child's Guidance Clinic of their young student's inability to form connections with classmates, as well as David's struggle to conform to gender roles. Throughout his lengthy article, John Kel... Calipino. Calipino repeatedly refers to David's defiance of feminine traits as if trying to prove that this... That this should have shown David was a boy. Yet gender roles are completely socially contrived and are used to subject women to a patriarchal culture. One's resistance to gender roles has nothing to do with their gender identity. So I know that I know what Calipino is trying to do. He's trying to be like, hey, the signs were obvious. This kid was a boy. I get that. And then a lot of times when we're talking about trans kids or intersex kids, we're talking about they, they show signs of embracing a masculine or feminine side. But I just want to be careful with that because that does not mean that your kid is transgender. Right. Your kid is transgender if they come to you and say, I'm a boy. This spot, this isn't right. Like this doesn't feel right. They're not trans because they like climbing trees or like playing with Barbies. Right. 
So just, just, but that's what, that's kind of the point that Calipino was trying to make. And I'm just saying that wasn't it. David was going to psychiatrists and, and bluntly telling them, I'm a boy. Mm-hmm. He was doing that. David's eventual session with the guidance clinic psychiatrist did lend insight into the disturbing reality of David Reimer's situation. The physician wrote that David had strong fears that something had been done to their genital organs and that David had some suicidal thoughts. Concerns caused David's case to be passed along to the head of psychiatry, Dr. Dr. Keith Sigmundson. Once the psychiatrist learned the truth about David's case, a fact the budding teen still was not aware of, Sigmundson hesitantly moved forward with Dr. Money's plan. So nobody knew except for David's parents and Money, and then people at the John, Ho- some people at John Hopkins. So then they inform Keith Sigmundson of what they're trying to do, and he's kind of like, I don't really like this, but this plan's been in place for 13 years. I'll kind of move forward with it, or 11 years at that point. Yet, as the case developed, the physician became more and more uncomfortable with Money's methods. After referring David to a colleague, known only as Dr. M, for evaluation, the outside party reported that Joan told the psychiatrist, I'm just a boy with long hair and girls' clothes. Despite this claim, Dr. M still tried to convince David to go through with the vaginal surgery that Dr. Money was pushing. So he's contacting everyone being like, you need to convince her, quote unquote, to go through with this surgery. She really needs it. This poor child. I know. Like, their it's whole awful. life. Keith Sigmundson, on the other hand, became even more resistant to the idea. He wrote to Money and elaborated on David's trouble at school and his continued talk of suicide. John Money rep- responded that Joan's troubles were a result of their refusal to complete their vaginal construction and stated that this fear was rooted in a fear of hospitals and not in the truth that David Reimer did not want the surgery because he feared it would erase his male identity completely. Money also attributed David's increasing resistance to hormone treatments to Money's fabricated fear of hospitals. Yeah, he just kept being like, you know, Joan's just so afraid of hospitals. I mean, they ran screaming from the room one time if I even mentioned hospitals. Why the fuck do you think they're fe- afraid of hospitals, John Money? What If a child is afraid of a hospital, it's rooted in something. Right. And he's just like, I don't know. They don't like the white tile floors, bright it's lights. The, it's the bright lights, I'm <laughs> telling you. Some, those bright lights get me sometimes, too. Right. So, while the vaginal surgery was delayed, Money decided to introduce estrogen pills to David at age 14. Previously, David had been on hormone blockers, which prevents puberty from happening. In fact, many trans and intersex children today are placed on hormone blockers, which is a completely safe method provided the child wants to be on blockers. The worst side effects if a child stops the blockers are a delayed onset of puberty traits such as breast development, body hair, acne, and a drop in the vocal range. For children questioning their gender identity, this gives them more time to become aware of themselves. However, in the case of David Reimer, he was never given the option to choose these this method. So again, it's not that hormone blockers are wrong. Hormone blockers are wrong if the child has no say in it. Right. Um, when Dr. Money introduced the estrogen pills, David asked what they would do. His dad replied, it's to make you wear a bra. David had a meltdown. He didn't want to wear a bra and he didn't want to be a girl. But John Money came through with the lies and intimidations as always. He told David he would grow unwanted limbs if he did not take the pills. An even more horrifying fate for a child that already felt so socially ostracized. David relented and took the pills. In his annual update, Dr. Money wrote, now pre pubertal in age, the girl has a feminine gender identity and role, distinctly different from that of her brother. The final and conclusive evidence awaits the appearance of romantic interest and erotic imagery. Yeah, he's just like, if I can just get Joan to fantasize about men and want to have sex with men, then my, my work's complete. Again, conflating sexual orientation with gender identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was even a mention there where David had once said, um, the doctor had asked him, like, well, are you attracted to girls? And David's like, I mean, yeah, I don't know, I guess. And the doctor's like, okay, well, are you okay with being a lesbian? And David's like, I mean, homosexuality is not a big deal to me. That's just what he said. It was mm-hmm. one time that they mentioned it. So the doctor was like, all right, well, if you're a lesbian, I guess it's still worse, but it'd be better if you weren't, because then I'd really be able to show people how I converted you. Right. But the doctor never had a chance to follow through with his long-failed experiment. This was the year David threatened suicide if his parents made him see money again. And it was at this time that his parents revealed the true nature of David's sexual identity. Sessions were abruptly ended with Dr. Money, and both David and Brian entered intense therapy sessions. 
For the next two days, Keith Sigmund... Decades. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, big difference. <laughs> For the next two decades... Keith Sigmundson treated the twins, helping David get on testosterone and undergo his sex-affirming surgeries. Both the boys struggled with depression and trauma from the money experience experiments. So David was able to, you know, I mean, there's a lot of surgeries. He had to have a mastectomy. He did ha- end up having penile construction. He, um, you know, he got on his testosterone. But for the rest of his life, you know, he had to adjust. And, and uh, again, I didn't put it in there, but there was like... These identical twin boys, when you when um, Calipino interviewed them years later, like uh, Brian was just had much more masculine traits overall because he had been uh, mm-hmm. allowed to develop that way, whereas David was still had like some traces of femininity, and that's not that's not wrong. It's just showing again these twins what would they have looked like if they had been allowed to adjust the same. Right. For over ten years, the story of the John Joan case faded from the medical scene only reappearing when John Money wanted to tout his own success. But in Honolulu, Hawaii, an old doctor smelled bullshit. Melton Diamond had not approved of John Money's forced gender assignment in the John Jones case. After Money claimed he ended his studies, Diamond began to publish an ad in the American Psychiatric Society Journal. Will whoever is treating the twins please report? <laughs> the bulletin read. <laughs> just real to the point. Yep. Just like, hey, hello. <laughs> Each time it posted, Dr. Sigmundson saw it and wanted to reach out, but he wasn't ready. Finally, in 1991, the two doctors connected and began to discuss the case slowly over the next three years. Yeah, uh, Diamond, I don't know like what his um, thing was with money. I don't know if he like had a personal thing against him, but he was just like, or it just it was just the fact that he's like, you you can't fucking force a kid to change like that. You're what you're saying you're doing. You're saying you're helping this intersex kid, and that's just a lie. I can tell mm-hmm. that from this study. And so Diamond really, because I don't think Sigmundson would have ever had the courage to speak up. But Diamond's like, I don't give a fuck. Right. I'm in Let's Hawaii. I'm in go. my sixties. We'll do it. Mm-hmm. So 1994, David and his mother and wife. So David again had been married. Agreed to sit for Diamond's interviews. This eventually led to the 1997 breakthrough article in the archives of adolescent and pediatric medicine. Keith Sigmundson had said he would have never spoke about the case publicly because he was scared to death of John Money. And Money's power was evident as the New England Journal, the American Pediatric, and the American Psychiatric Medical Magazines all turned down Diamond and Sigmundson's article. But once the article was finally published in the archives, the dam burst open. This was further expounded by Calipino's follow-up in the Rolling Stone just a few months later. The thing is, you can't bury journalism. No. So, like, even though these places were like, oh, we're not going to publish that, we're not going to publish that, they're like, fine, we'll go, whoever will publish it, we'll publish it, and guess what? Then it's out there. Yeah, exactly. Stop, try to stop us. Exactly. In typical arrogant fashion, Dr. Money shot back against the accusations and criticisms as a threat to the feminist movement. Oh, you <laughs> piece of crap. He's just such a patron of women and and, and, mm-hmm. and the LGBTQ. He was still caught up in his own broken thinking that gender construction was imperative to social adjustment, insisting that the attacks were actually on his choice to raise David as a girl and not on the fact that he assigned a gender identity to David and then forced him to conform through sexist gender roles. In one of his final reports on the John Joan case, Money had triumphantly declared the study was Traumatic proof that the gender identity option is open at birth for normal infants. However, in their article, Diamond had stated that Money's study actually proved that sexual orientation and gender identity were instilled at birth and could not be socially constructed through forced gender roles. Yeah, he's just like, oh, it's because I, I made him a girl. Isn't it? That's what your problem is. And people are like, no. I mean, yeah, but not because he's a girl, right, because, because you forced him right. to be something and he that he's not. Didn't want to do it. Yeah. He just, he, I mean, for the rest of his life, he's just like, oh, all those alt right groups who hate women just are mad at me for this. <laughs> Over the previous 30 years, Money's work had caused immense damage to many intersex children who had been assigned a gender based on the size and shape of the genitals. So his, his work in the John Jones case, like, shaped the way intersex children were treated for years. And really, I mean, it, it just basically, he's just like, you can just assign your kid whatever you want. It doesn't matter what they have. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. Caused so much damage. Exactly. Diamond and Sigmundson's article on the story of David Reimer changed the narrative around gender identity. Privately, John Money had long admitted to a few close confidence that he failed in his experiments and abandoned his methods. I, that was what was reported. I couldn't find verification of that, but people did say that privately he mm-hmm. knew it was a fail. 
Yet publicly, he would defend the John Joan case until he withdrew from public life due to Parkinson's in 2002. He received the Magnus Hirschfeld Medal the same year and donated a large portion of his art collection to a New Zealand art gallery before leaving um, the Magnus Hirschfeld, if you don't remember, that was the basically the modern day, or if not, just the um, creator of sexology in Germany. While Money lived a long and full life, the same would not be said for David and Brian Reimer. On July 1st, 2002, at age 36, Brian Reimer overdosed on antidepressants, passing away the same year. John, Mo- oh, passing away the same year, John Money received his award for sexual research. Two years later, David Reimer drove to a grocery store parking lot and shot himself. He was 38 years old and never got to live to be even half the age of John Money, who outlived the twins by two years. Dr. Money passed away from complications around his Parkinson's diagnosis in 2006, one day before his 85th birthday. He destroyed so many children's lives Mm -hmm. because of his false research and reporting. And and just his arrogance. Like, I mean, uh, first of all, it's completely unethical. Those those experiments were completely unethical. But even to decades later, still stand by that. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is most atrocious. Like you lied about your research. He only saw the, the, the twins once a year for like, I think like it's a week or something. He would see them. And so he didn't have like a daily hands on, but he was overseeing their care through other doctors, mm-hmm. contacting them, telling them what to do. And then when it comes out all those years later to still be like, well, you know, did the best I can, you know, it, it, that's what's astounding. You lied about your research. You lied about what happened. You never followed up with the twins. Like to, to, to do that level of a research on a person and never follow up with them. Come on, man. You knew what you were going to find if you felt right. You followed that's why up. he just did it for a little bit. He's like, oh, yeah. you know, if, uh, I can see the best of what I want to see. I can get it done in a week and I can convince myself yeah. that it's not that bad. Well, I mean, yeah, but I mean that like when they cut off their sessions with him, for him to never even call five, ten years later oh, and yeah. be like, hey, are you still adjusting? Mm-hmm. No, because you knew. You right. knew that they had you rejected. Knew the you knew what you had done. And that's, I think, what's most atrocious about it. You know, and that's why I don't really understand people still defending him, you know, to say, well, well, he made all these other advancements. Okay, but there's also a reality of like, I don't know, again don't know what he did i hope there's a well if there is a hell he's definitely in a very particular part of hell yeah after john calipino's groundbreaking article he began work for a book that was published in 2001 as nature made him the boy who was raised a girl brought the story of david and brian further into the spotlight the previous year bbc's horizon had aired the episode the boy who was turned into a girl and four years later dr money and the boy with no penis are aired on hair Her- horizons as well Several other articles and series have featured the heartbreaking story of the twins. Today, the horrific experiment serves as a reminder that gender identity cannot be forced onto anyone regardless of the circumstances at hand. It further develops the subject of sex, orientation, identity, and expression. You sounded like me trying to read that paragraph. I know, (laughs) right? I'm stumbling all over the place. But yeah, and honestly, the... As horrible as it is, and I'm so sad that it happened. Like it's so awful. But this is what really cl- crystallized, like those those sections, like between identity, orientation, sex, and expression. Like this is what really like made people realize. Because mm-hmm. of course, as a cisgender person, couldn't learn it right. from the intersex oh, and trans all people. All of these trans <laughs> trans people and intersex people have been saying this for years, right? Oh, but no, don't worry. We've got this cis person, and he wants to be a male. Oh, yeah. imagine if it had been reverse. Oh, like yeah. if they want, if the person wanted to be a female, they'd probably be like, mm, oh. "Honey, we're gonna work on this. You're, you're a boy. I promise." <laughs> probably, you're absolutely right. That's what I said. Yeah, at the beginning, like if he had been born, if he had been assigned female at birth, I wonder what, how much, and there had been, there would have been a like, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Like the, um, it is definitely um, sexism and homophobia and transphobia at play in all of this. Mm-hmm. So your recommended resources are Dr. Money and the Boy with No Penis, available on YouTube and linked on our script, or John Calapino's original article, The True Story of John Joan, which is also available for free and linked on our script. We also suggest you check out the Intersex Society and Advocates for Intersex Youth to learn more about what it means to be intersex and how you can be a better ally. And also on Queer Digest, our queer news website, there is an intersex section Mm -hmm. um, where we currently publish articles from um, 
one of those two sources and I'm looking for more sources to bring in more intersex education and news and awareness. Yeah. So you can email your queer story at Gmail. If you run a blog and you are intersex or you work for an organization that is intersex, Queer Digest only publishes queer created content. But if you are queer and you create content, you can contact us about getting your, uh, your site listed for free. It's a, mm-hmm. like I said, it's like a, it's a, like a, Google. <laughs> well, we have um, yeah. an. It's kind of like if you went to CNN, right? And you can read all the news. But this is mm-hmm. aggregation from all of these queer sources. We also have our own search engine called the QueerNet, mm-hmm. um, where we can add you there as well. So if somebody wants to look up intersex, yeah, they can find articles written by queer or uh, queer and intersex and every yeah person. And you're not getting you know articles from straight places who have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, so check that out. And, um, you know, I would encourage you to watch the documentary. It's about 45 minutes long. Um, if you can, if you want to know more about the story, I think we've covered it pretty well, but, um, and just really like, yeah, it's so sad that this is what it took to really bring to light these, um, what it means for gender identity. But, um, and it's so sad, you know, both those twins lost their life because Mm -hmm. of that abuse and it's just horrific. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyways. On that note. Stay queer. Don't get a lobotomy. We love you, our little alley hookers. And a little succulent sapphire. Resist the oppressors, our proud homocrats. And have yourself a sodomy circus or... Don't. Yes. <laughs> and Black Lives Matter. Bye. Bye.